My name is Ali. I'm a doctor and YouTuber. I'm Taymor. I'm a data scientist and writer. And you're listening to Not Overthinking, the weekly podcast where we think about happiness, creativity, and the human condition. Hello, everyone, and welcome back to another episode of Not Overthinking. Taymor, how are you doing today? I'm doing all right. I actually have a new webcam set up as of this week. So I have a fancy camera, which is looking at my face. So hopefully when we upload these episodes to YouTube next week, I think you said we'd do it next week, right, Ali? I think that's a plan, yeah. Okay, <laughs> you're handling that side of things. So let's see what happens. Yeah, we will see. We'll see how that goes. But yeah, you'll look uh, nice and nice and good on the webcam, as they say. Yeah. Um, although there's a bit of a problem because the camera is positioned like to the side of my monitor. So when I'm looking at your face on the screen, like the camera will see me looking off to the side, which is a bit weird. <laughs> so I don't know how to solve that. But I guess it's the same for you. Yeah, like, it's always a problem with these sort of webcam setup where I have my camera kind of 45 degrees from me. So when I actually look at the screen, it looks like I'm not looking at the camera. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I've, I've, I've got a, um, there's, there's a YouTuber I know who uses one of these teleprompter setups on top no of the lens, connects a monitor to it, and then That's HDMI's amazing. that in as like a third oh. monitor. And so you can make eye contact while looking at someone on a Zoom call. Right, and that, that is that. like <laughs> the pinnacle. <laughs> Because teleprompters, for, the, for those of you who don't know, have one-way glass, so you can see something on the screen, but the lens won't recognize the thing on the screen, which is how you can read stuff on a teleprompter without it looking as if you're kind of not looking at the lens. Anyway, all that aside, today is a very exciting episode because we are joined by a, uh, a friend of ours called Neil. Neil, welcome to the show. How are you doing? I'm doing pretty well, thanks. Thanks for having me. That's, that, that's quite all right. Uh, before we get into anything, we need to talk about this week's uh, sponsor, uh, for the podcast. And this week is actually Brilliant, who are very kindly sponsoring uh, this podcast. They are sponsoring us again for 2021. So clearly you guys were doing something right in going to brilliant.org forward slash not overthinking in 2020 because they wanted to continue to support our podcast. Um, but Brilliant, Brilliant, I think, ties ties in nicely with Neil because Neil um, probably doesn't want us to mention this, but Neil studied maths at Cambridge and actually ranked first in his year group, which is like a huge deal. Um, so Neil, do you want to tell us a little bit about intuition and how uh, brilliant is the best thing ever <laughs> uh of course so um i'm a really big fan of like actually understanding things rather than just memorization or going through the motions and i think if i was making a list of the things that i think most math students get wrong it's just focusing on details rather than the bigger picture and i think what brilliant brilliantly achieves is actually trying to give people an understanding of what the hell is going on and the way I kind of think about maths, it's like you figure out what the hell is going on and then all of the details just click into place. But if you do it the wrong way around, you just spend three years really confused and then never touch maths again. It sounds like this is music to tame all years. Yeah, <laughs> he, has, he, has, he has said this many a time. <laughs> I wish you told me that like five years ago. <laughs> <laughs> Anyway, if you guys want to improve your own intuition, then as, as you know by now, Brilliant is a fantastic online platform for courses in maths, science, and computer science. So head over to brilliant.org forward slash not overthinking. And the first 200 people to click that link this week, assuming 200 of you click that link, uh, will get 20% off the annual premium subscription and it helps support the podcast. So win-win all round. Uh, uh, how, was, how was that as a, a sponsored plug, Tamer? I think that was solid. Maybe we should have Neil on every week to do the Brilliant plug. <laughs> yeah, we can do like a pre-recorded segment. Yeah. <laughs> if, if you want, I can just say like, I'm Neil and I endorse this message. <laughs> and you can just pay me half of your sponsorship fees and I'll give you my permission to use that. All right. That's, that's, that sounds like it would be pretty good overall. Yeah, Depen it, it, it depends on, on how volume. conversions go this year. So, so guys, if you want Neil to, to continue to be on the podcast, brilliant org slash not overthinking. Anyway, um, so Neil. Uh, <laughs> We connected through like a friend, uh, like like a, a mutual friend, and then you have a blog where you've written lots and lots of blog posts, which are all very well thought out and well, most very nicely, most of them. Uh, and I referenced your, your blog in an email newsletter several months ago, and loads of people replied to that email saying, "Oh my god, I love this guy. This blog has changed my life," and all this sort of thing. So I thought it'd be really interesting to have you on the podcast to talk about some of the stuff that we're all uh, mutually interested in. But in particular, the whole sort of effective altruism vibe and how we can sort of do good in the world in a sort of rational um, setting. But b before we kind of get into that, it would be great to hear sort of what what's like your story? How did how did we get here? If you can give us a little bit of background about about you. Uh, sure. So I guess I'm the kind of person who loves optimizing things and just like everything in my life. 
like, I just find it really intuitive to find goals, to strategize, to plan things. I find it really exciting to, like, 80-20 things, find the clever hacks, find the ways to make things better. And, I mean, I'm hoping a lot of your listeners will vibe with this, but I think I take this pretty far. Like, one of my favorite projects ever was trying to, noticing that I didn't really have close friends, and then trying to optimize my ability to, like, form emotional bonds and, like, actually vibe with people. And this somehow actually worked, and I'm still confused about this. Wait, we have, we have to dig into this. Can you, can you elaborate a bit? How long have you been uh, this? Okay, so, like, back when I was in school, um, I had friends, but I never really had close friends, and I never really realized that this was, like, a thing that could happen. Um, how, how are you defining close friends? Uh, hmm, kind of like people who I know really well. Like, I know how they think. I know what matters to them. I know their, like, fears and insecurities. I feel comfortable just hanging out with them, being vulnerable and, like, sharing the things on my mind. And, like, we kind of guess each other. That definition you two vibe with? Yeah, I can get on yeah, that. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, I, I, Just before this, this podcast recording, I was actually doing one of these... Uh, plan your life exercises and they were talking about it. close friends and the metric they used is i think people that you would be comfortable ringing up at three o'clock in the morning if you needed something and i <laughs> felt very un uncomfortable with that particular definition because i feel like i've got close friends but uh, you, you know <laughs> i would generally feel uncomfortable about ringing someone at three o'clock in the morning mm. but anyway uh, i don't know i value my outside. friends but i also yeah. value my sleep exactly yeah <laughs> and the better rest i am the more fun i am to be around so really if they don't ring me at 3 a.m it's an investment in our friendship <laughs> but anyway, um, and then I ended up in this like year long relationship that ended partway through first year. And when I was like over the my heart being broken and all of that jazz, I was thinking about what I missed from that. And I think one of the things I really missed was that we were kind of actually good friends. And this is the first time this had really happened. And because I like optimizing things, I was like, okay how can I fix this as, like, efficiently as possible? And so I was thinking back on, like, the people I kind of felt close with, and the people I had bonded with, and the common themes, and I said, okay, I think vulnerability, honesty, sharing personal things, and, like, kind of actually putting in effort and supporting each other seem like the common themes here. So how can I get more of this in my life? And uh, the brilliant idea that 19 year old Neil came up with was so you guys know 36 questions to fall in love oh yes the New York yeah. Times thing uh, so I was like okay so sharing personal things and being honest seems the key here and there's like loads of these lists of questions online of kind of deep personal questions that aren't the kind of things that normally come up I think like half of them are crap but half of them are interesting so I made a short list of my favorites and then I went to a bunch of the people who I was kind of friends with and said, hey, I'm trying to become close friends with people. Um, are you down for just like going for a several hour walk, going through this list and just like trying to actually get to know each other? Somehow, a bunch of them said yes. And then I had about a 50% success rate for like still being really good friends with them today. Wow. And that's a pretty solid success rate. I know. I was like, I, I, I still can't really believe this worked. And, like, nowadays, I'm a lot less artificial than this. And, like, I try not to do the, like, standard list of questions thing. Um, but I kind of think of it as, like, I had this default way of doing socialising and friendships, where you only do small talk, you only talk about surface level things. And going through this list of deep personal questions just, like, broke me out of that and put me far away in some completely different, like, place of the social landscape. And I tried that for a while. And that made me realize that, like, uh huh, you can just kind of be vulnerable and get close to people way, way faster than you normally do. And a lot of people just really vibe with this. And I think that I just leveled up a ton in just ability to become close to people in that project. Oh, wow. That sounds interesting. Wait, so but before that, was there, was there like a fear of like, vulnerability like you were kind of scared of being vulnerable with people it just wouldn't really come to your mind that oh i can like open up about something or i can like ask them about something what was mm. going on before that yeah more the second one it just like okay. wasn't a thing that i realized i could do 
Okay, right, yeah. yeah. <laughs> it's like it's not like you're in an RP you're like in a role playing game and in social interaction you have like a few actions. Like yeah. Chat, ask about <laughs> yeah. the weather, give them a compliment, and <laughs> ask a deep personal question just wasn't on my action list. Oh god. And I realized yeah. that it just can be. Yeah. Um so what's an example of one of the uh, like what what's an example of vulnerability in this particular context? Um hmm. Like what's something that you'd be more open to sharing with uh like now that you may not have uh, earlier. So and and just to give a, a bit, mm -hmm. bit of context like the 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 first time we still we, we we spoke I also felt like an instant like connection to you because you know we were both I feel like sharing quite s s somewhat vulnerable things and you said something that oh you know it 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 makes me anxious when I have phone calls like this because XX. I was like, oh wow, that's like such a nice thing to say because I felt a little bit like I, I sort of anxious about this phone call as well because I'd been reading your blog and stuff and the fact that you sort of put that feeling into words made me feel instantly at ease. Um, mm, yeah, a sad fact is that my level of anxiety is directly proportional to the amount of YouTube subscribers somebody has, <laughs> so that conversation was just off the charts. Um, oh, well. But it's a learning process, isn't it? Yeah, I think. Like, people tend not to talk about, like, their anxieties or insecurities or, like, things that bother them, or just, like, things that aren't going that great in your life. And, um, I think you can take talking about this a bit too far. Like, I think, I don't really like being around people who just only ever talk about the ways their life sucks, but just being open that it's a thing going in your mind, that it's not a big deal, but it's just, like, there, and you're comfortable sharing it, I think goes a long way. A social strategy I like quite a lot is I kind of think about conversations as giving the other person hooks to dig into, into whatever they find interesting. So I just like, in the standard how's your life going bit of the conversation, you just bring up the things that I think are genuinely interesting that I might want to talk about and don't push on them, but just leave them there. And sometimes the other person picks on one, sometimes they don't. And if you just give enough hooks, you'll eventually get into a conversation you both actually enjoy. And I think a lot of people get kind of closed off by default, and it's hard to get anything to happen with them. And just saying, implicitly saying, oh, here is a wide range of things I'd be excited to discuss with you. Pick the ones that you think are fun. Just means you have way more awesome conversations. This is an idea that I, I so I, I came across in a book when I was, I think, 18. Or 19 so similar age to when you were when you discovered the stuff it, it was called like uh, charisma on command and the way that they described it was as if it's uh they, they called it velcro theory <laughs> which is as if you're providing lots and lots of velcro straps uh in in your opening spiel for like hey what do you do or how's your day going or what's up uh just to be able for, for someone to kind of latch on with 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 velcro and so i was like oh this is this is really interesting um and that that advice I I also started using when I would do interviews and things, well, and when coaching book. people on like med school interviews that you know when someone asks you why medicine or anything like that, you just give them a few different velcros to hook onto, and then they will just ask you about whatever they're most interested in. Uh, hmm. Yeah, I love that. I think this is like one of the most useful things I ever really got for just having good conversations consistently. Um, nice. And like being able um, to do the same with what the other person says, like notice the hint of oh that's a bit surprising or like that's a novel thing you said that i don't think i quite agree with or i don't quite understand and just say like oh that was interesting can i hear more about that and then if you do yeah. this like four times in the same conversation you've probably just gone down a random path that you haven't got down at a conversation before nice um but so, anyway th this was we were talking about kind of your story. So this was yes. like 19 when you sort of revolutionized your own social interaction by realizing that you can systematically uh, become closer with people. Um, um, yeah, I think it's also worth yeah. stressing that like the idea isn't the, in each conversation, you're like aggressively optimizing it through the details because it doesn't really work. Uh, people think you're a bit weird or like a bit cold. What you gotta do is you come up with like a good high level strategy for finding situations that go well, and then the situation you just kind of go with the flow, or maybe go with the flow, but every so often you check your list of questions and like pick the next one, but then you just try to like let things happen. And the optimization is you put yourself in situations where going with the flow works well, rather than just leading to an hour of discussing the weather. Yeah. But anyway, 
So um, yeah, I, I... Think, I, I think that's an important caveat to, uh, to, to make because one thing that we've noticed in a lot of our episodes recently where, you know, for example, when, when you're explaining this, both Tamer and I know that you're not going to be militantly aggressive with this tactic. But someone listening to the podcast might uncharitably interpret your thing and say, wow, this guy's weird. He's going to be militantly aggressive. And so just <laughs> having that slight caveat is like, guys, <laughs> you know, <laughs> this is not about being, <laughs> being super aggressive. This is about kind of using it and going with the flow most of the time. I think that's uh, it's quite helpful. Mm. Um, yeah, I find I get this a lot when I talk about the idea of optimizing. Like, a lot of people come up with reasons why optimizing is bad. People don't and like, like it, man. <laughs> they don't like um, it. <laughs> yeah. But I'm like, actually, no, that's awesome. Um, because if you try to optimize things and you make all your conversations really militant and aggressive, that doesn't work. And so if you're good at optimizing, you need to understand all of the common ways that like an 18 year old trying to optimize their life fails and figure out what you're going to do about each of those. And if you can address all of the like common complaints, then you're probably doing pretty well. Yeah, you need some regular regularization in there. Exactly. Right. <laughs> so um, but anyway, um, I, I didn't get it. Um, so, as you can probably tell, I like optimizing things. And uh, a couple of years ago, when I was reading around things online, I came across this movement called Effective Altruism, um, that was basically had the core pitch of I care a lot about doing good. Some charities or ways of doing good are a lot more effective than others, so we should figure out what those are and do those. And to someone like me, who like optimizing things, this just clicked. Like, yeah, of course. Um, but I didn't really do anything about this. Um, I kind of cared on an intellectual level, but not really on an emotional level. And I'm the kind of person who cares a lot about consistency. And it's not kind of sad. Like, if you have a value, and you never act on the value, is it actually a value? Um, and in hindsight, I basically just spent several years procrastinating. Um, but then, about two years ago, I was doing this classic student thing of trying to figure out what the hell I was doing with my life. Like, the whole, what is my meaning? What is my purpose? And, like, I like optimizing things, but if you don't have a goal, then it's just kind of purposeless or you're optimizing for the wrong thing. And like a lot of the obvious goals like money or status or prestige were like, I could go and just try to get those, but I don't actually care about them and it would feel kind of empty. And I knew that I cared about things like happiness and fulfillment, but I can get those in loads of different ways. So it's not really a drive. Um, and I realized that one of the few things that actually did seem worth making a central purpose was I want to make progress on the world's biggest problems and make the world a better place. And I can't really imagine putting a bunch of effort toward, I can't really imagine regressing putting a bunch of effort towards this. Um, but I still had this reluctance of, I just didn't feel like a strong, passionate drive to do this. Like, you hear about these people who spend their lives working with NGOs in Africa in terrible conditions, making the world a better place, and I'm just not the kind of person who would be able to do that day in and day out. Um, but the thing that clicked is I realized that I don't need this to do a lot of good. Like, there are ways of doing a lot of good that aren't a sacrifice. Like, I can find important problems to work on that I think are interesting. Um, I can find the work that matters and try to figure out how to shape the work to fit my motivations. Um, and like, I think the effect of altruism movement was a really big part in this click happening for me because both it gave me a lot of important ideas about what doing good means, but I'm also the kind of person who gets pretty socially influenced. Like the saying, you're the average of the like 10 closest friends is very true for me. And I get all my motivation from being around people. And in Effective Altruism, I met this community of like awesome people who actually cared about making the world better and were doing something about this. And making a lot of friends who care about that really made that click on an emotional level in a way that just thinking about this didn't. Mm. And 
kind of added it to my list of RPG actions that I could take in my life. Okay, so that's interesting. Uh, one thing I, I, I wrote I wrote down as you, as you were talking is that you said that one of the one of the tenets of effective altruism is this idea that, or rather, w one of the ways that you were thinking was that a I care about doing good. B there are ways of doing good in the world that are more effective in inverted commas than others. Therefore, I should uh, sort of optimize for those effective ways of doing good. And and the thing I wrote down was this idea of I care about doing good. Um, this is something that we discussed with uh, our mutual friend Lucia as well on a podcast a few months ago about this this gulf between the intellectual yes, doing good in the world is a good thing versus the this is something I actually care about on an emotional level. And and so you said that when you when you started hanging out with people who were into this sort of stuff it helped it click emotionally can you identify like what it was about hanging out with these people that helped you emotionally care about doing good rather than just intellectually care about doing good hmm. does it add like a social sort of status element to it where you know you get the kind of long-term deep meaningful benefits of doing good and living by your own values but you also get some like nice short-term benefits of making friends and people thinking you're a nice and cool guy and instead of finding your tribe and kind of participating in your tribe is it is it that or is that a bit uncharitable <laughs> um so i think that's definitely part of it like one thing that often comes up when thinking about altruism is some people think that it just has to be this purely noble selfless thing where you're sacrificing everything you care about to make the world better and i just I don't vibe with that at all. Like, I think what matters is there are people who could be suffering who are not. There are, like, lives saved. The world is a better place. If the people doing this have, like, really awesome, happy lives full of pleasure and hedonism, like, that's great. This is fine. And I think that people are motivated by these base things like status and prestige. And if you can make doing good be the thing that gets you loads of status and prestige, but make sure it's actually doing good, not just looking like you're doing good. Like, I think that's awesome. Um, which is a long preamble to say, yes, totally. Um, or, it's so like, part of it is there's a sense of status and prestige of a lot of my friends think that doing good as effectively as you can is awesome. Um, part of it is hanging out with people who think a lot about motivation, but think about it from the perspective of, I know what I want to be doing, I know the kind of person I want to be is able to just, like, do what's best for the world. I'm not that kind of person. How can I shape my life so I get closer to that kind of person? And realizing that that was a thing that I could do. Um, I think another thing that's pretty important to my motivation, at least personally, is concreteness. Like, for a while, I couldn't imagine a life that wasn't being a maths academic, because I was doing a maths degree, I liked pure maths, I was good at pure maths, and I'd never really done anything else. The real world seemed far off and scary. And I think in hindsight, what was going on is that I... It felt concrete what doing maths was like. It didn't feel concrete what doing anything else was like. But just going out of the world and trying things makes them feel much more concrete. And if it's concrete, I can imagine a life where I do this. Um, I actually... Um, I'm currently on a gap year of doing some internships and things that I think could be really important for the world. And a large part of my goal here is actually see what doing this might be like, make it concrete, and at the end of the year say, is there something that I am now excited about? Because I think you just can't tell if you never tried something. Yeah, yeah. for sure. Yeah, yeah there's, a, there's, there's a book that we mention in almost every single podcast episode called Aspiration by... Um, Agnes Callard where uh yeah the book's basically about like how do we go from how do we basically change our values you know like previously maybe you didn't care about doing good now you care you know one of your values is doing good but like what does that process look like of sort of actually changing your value system and and one interesting example that she gives in the book is that okay suppose you are suppose you're you know you're in school you're sort of like a music student and you you don't currently appreciate like opera or something, but you feel like there's probably something to this whole opera thing and you, you want to gain the value of appreciating opera. Um, now, like there, there's like a gulf between, you know, I, I don't appreciate opera right now. I want to like appreciate opera, you know, in the future. 
And I think a lot of people get stuck at this gulf because it feels inauthentic. It feels like, look, I don't appreciate opera now. Like, it, it, surely, like, it, it's a bit phony for me to, like, go to these operas and stuff and pretend like I like it or whatever. Um, but I think, you know, one of the points that Agnes makes in the book is that these value changes are, you know, it, it's it's a process where there's, like, a gradient from, like, not having the value to having the value. And so, like, you know, in order to appreciate opera, you will go to opera a bunch of times. The first few times, you know, you might not actually get it, but eventually, you know, over time, it might actually sort of grow on you. And so I think that's kind of about making the thing concrete where, like, you you can't truly appreciate or really hold the value until you've kind of, you know, done something towards it, you know? <laughs> um, like, you can't really, you can't really th think that you are a parent or you can't really think that you understand or appreciate what it's like to be a parent until you have actually taken some steps towards it, i.e. I have had kids. Um, and so I, I, that sort of reminded me of the thing you're saying about kind of making these things concrete that are otherwise just like nice abstract ideas that mm. you might like or you might like to like. Yeah, I like that. I think another point with concreteness is when talking about altruism and like extreme altruism, like I want to actually make the world better in ways that matter altruism. It's kind of easy to get a bit cynical and think thinking about this as naive. And I think one of the reasons that happens is somebody's imagining some starry-eyed teen who's looking at the world and saying, I want to make this better, but has no plans, no idea how to do this. And they're just going to pick the easiest available thing. Um, and one of the things I really like about the effect of our trust community is it can give me actual concrete plans for, okay, here is a specific problem that I think really matters, and here is a specific way I think the world could be different such that this problem is less of an issue, and now I'm going to backchain from that goal and figure out what I could do to make this happen. And obviously the world is complicated, you can't perfectly strategize your way to fixing it, but I think having some plans is like a really good antidote to this cynicism or nihilism where things just feel overwhelming and unfixable. Um, but I think we're being kind of vague, so maybe it'd be good if I just talked a bit about what effective altruism actually is. For... Sure, yeah, let's uh, put it in more concrete terms. Sure, so um, I think the movement kind of breaks down into two parts. There's this there's the intellectual project of, I want to make the world a better place. I want to do this effectively. I only have so many resources, so much time and effort to give. How do I do this? And what does that actually mean? And this is a really hard problem. Like, I don't know the answers. It takes a lot of effort. You need, we have a bunch of tools from like science, economics, philosophy, fun sign the world, and we can apply them to this problem. Um, and the second part is the practical project of actually doing something about it and a community of people who try to put this into practice in different ways. Um, one thing I kind of want to emphasize is EA isn't about, uh, sorry, jargon alert, I'm going to abbreviate effective altruism to EA a bunch in this episode because it's a long word. Um, it's not like a single group or an organization. It's like a philosophy and a community of lots of people and lots of different organizations trying to make the world better in their own way. Um, and uh, given that this is kind of complex and messy, I was thinking it might work to break this podcast down into one, talking about the intellectual project and what the ideas are, and two, the, talking about the practical project, like if the viewers vibe with this and care about this, what could they actually do about it? Yeah, sounds like a plan. Um, okay, so I think the m main interesting and novel idea is this whole idea of effectiveness. Like, I hope people are pretty on board with altruism. Um, and, s but I think it's not natural to a lot of people to think hard about effectiveness and calculation when thinking about how to improve the world. Um, and I think the first step when thinking about effectiveness is think about why I actually care about altruism and making the world better. And I think for me, it's that I think there's a lot of pain, death, and suffering in the world. I think the world is very much not 
the way it could be. I also live in a world where everyone is happy, healthy, and thriving, and human civilization will flourish into the long-term future, and our children and our children's children will have lives far better than the lives we have today. Um, and this is fundamentally a statement about the world. It's not a statement about feeling good or feeling like I'm improving things. Like, when I save a life, what matters is that there is a person who has, like, hopes, dreams, a story, and they are able to live that out rather than it being, like, abruptly snuffed out. And, um, like, that before my head is, like, cool and it can motivate me, but it's not the goal. And this means that you need to be results focused because if you can find a way to save more lives, which doesn't intuitively feel as good, that's way better because the goal is actually helping people and saving people. So you need to be grounded in the consequences. Um, and, um, I mean, I think the key insight of being results focused is just like a pretty generally applicable thing in life. Like, I know Ali talks a lot about uh, evidence-backed study techniques. Um, if you pull several all-nighters obsessively highlighting your notes, that is a lot less good than spending 50 minutes every morning doing your daily Anki and doing some space repetition, even if you're like working much harder in the first category, because what matters is you actually learn things and you actually get results. And, um, and I think that this is like a lot more important for doing good than a lot of people intuitively think. And the two key reasons here are that there's a big spread in how much good different things can do. And you can't help everyone, so you need to choose and make trade-offs for how you do good. So, um, an example I really like for this idea that there's a big spread is this idea called the 100x multiplier. So, there's a pretty robust result from sociology that people's welfare improves by about the same amount when you double their income, no matter how wealthy they originally were, bar like really rich people. Like, if somebody lives on a dollar a day and they go to two dollars a day, that's about as big a deal as somebody on a hundred dollars a day going to two hundred dollars a day. Um, and the world's poorest people are about a hundred times poorer than the average person in the West. Like, the average income in the US is about $30,000, um, and there are a bunch of people, like big charities help, that live on about a dollar a day, or about $300 a year. And you can kind of think of most interventions as basically just giving pe the equivalent to giving people money. Like, if you run a soup kitchen, that's kind of equivalent to giving people the money to, like, buy more food for themselves. And so the it would take about $30,000 to double the income of the average person in the US. But with that money, you could double the income of 100 people in Sub-Saharan Africa. And there's this awesome charity called Give Directly um, that just literally does that. It takes the world's poorest people and just gives them money. And these are the people who live on about a dollar a day. And um, personally, I think we can do even better than this. Like, Give Directly isn't the place that I actually give money to. But the key point here is that the spread is massive. And, um, like, I think when discussing global aid, there's often a lot of objections people have, like, oh, you're not respecting people's autonomy, you're creating dependency. But this is just literally giving the world's neediest people money and telling them, make your lives better, however you think is best. And it's a hundred times better than the average thing helping people in the West. And I think it's kind of hard to get your head around how big a deal a hundred X is. Like, in London, I spend about a thousand pounds a month on rent. If there were a hundred X differences in the rental market, then shopping around to putting an effort could get me an apartment for ten pounds a month. Um, if, it, if I spend about £2,000 on a, like, top-of-the-range MacBook, if there were 100x differences, shopping around get me one for, like, £20. Um, like, the normal world doesn't have 100x differences in it for things that are, like, as trivial as buying a laptop. But saving lives 
has these massive differences in it. And, um, like, it's easy to just do good by following your intuitions and following this warm, fuzzy feeling of helping people, but I don't find this 100x difference intuitive. So following my intuitions means I'll miss out on things like this. Um, and the second key point is that there are trade-offs, and the trade-offs matter. Like, um, if you think about something like time management, there are loads of awesome things I want to be doing. Like, I could be doing this podcast with you guys, I could be reading a machine learning textbook, I could be hanging out with my friends, um, I could be doing tutoring, earning some money. Um, I don't have enough time to do everything I want to do. And if I just say yes to everything that comes up, um, I'm implicitly saying no to things. I'm just saying no to things that come along later. Um, I need to learn how to prioritize because I can't avoid making a choice, but I can avoid choosing by default and just picking the things that come up first. And improving the world is the same key insight. You only have so much time, money, and energy to help people. You're always making a choice. But I want to make it a conscious choice, and because the spread is so big, I need to put in a lot of effort and a lot of attention to effectiveness. Sorry, end spiel. <laughs> okay. Yeah, that makes that makes a lot of sense. I guess one of the one of the key insights of I and and you can correct me if I'm uh, misrepresenting EA here, but mm -hmm. one of the insights that kind of quote sold me on it several years ago was the idea that you can actually put a value like a a monetary value on saving a life uh value value probably the wrong word more like cost like it costs a certain amount of money to actually save a life um and i think at the time an, an, an estimate that i heard is that maybe about two thousand five hundred dollars or two two thousand pounds to save a life through giving money to the against malaria foundation um is that is that roughly accurate? Is that is that how you think about the saving of lives in monetary costs as well, or are there other other factors that make this more nuanced? So, um, I think a common punchline in this interview is that everything is more complicated than initially seems. Mm -hmm. um, so yes, um, so uh, to flesh out that a bit more, um, there's this organization called GiveWell, who are an amazingly good charity evaluator who um, like do a lot of research into global health charities and global development charities and try to do look at the evidence base and try to do cost effectiveness calculations of how much good they do and one of their top charities is the against malaria foundation who give like bed nets to children in sub-saharan africa to protect them from malaria and malaria is like a really big deal like i think if you look at the entire history of human civilization Malaria is one of the biggest killers ever, and even today it still kills like half a million people a year, and uh, bed nets are really cheap. And um, so, yeah, GiveWell have this calculation that it costs, I think, £3,000 nowadays to save a life. Um, and um, obviously this is an average, you can't take this completely literally, but, and, but I think that, yeah, this is useful. And I think it's useful to like give context, like, I don't know, um, the average house in London costs like a million pounds. Um, that's about 300 lives. Um, it really gives context to like how we spend money. But I also find it helpful to think of this as like a lower bound. Um, because if you want to have a clear cost effectiveness calculation like this, you need to have a really robust evidence base. You need to be incredibly confident that your intervention works. And um, one of the like really interesting debates in effective altruism over the last few years is how much you should prioritize having really high confidence something works and like really robust estimates versus being open to more uncertainty if things could go way better. For example, if you're comparing a climate change charity to an um, anti-malaria charity, it's much harder to put, like, like, figure out how much a ton of CO2 converts to and, like, lives lost. 
but that doesn't mean that it's worse. Um, and like a common criticism of EA is that, ah, you're only doing cost effectiveness calculations and you're not open to things like systemic change. And uh, I don't think that's true. It's just really hard to do this. Um, but yeah, maybe it'd be good now to talk about like what EAs actually care about and how much of it is global health stuff like this. So before we before we move on to that, I think one more uh, more sort of philosophical note about Go this, I think, is uh, so. Look, I'm I'm very sympathetic towards EA. Um, I think one thing that some people struggle with, and I you know I struggle with this as well, is that you know if you take this completely utilitarian approach of you know trying to value a life and then uh, sort of optimizing your resources in order to save lives you know the the assumption is that uh yeah the, the whole the foundation of all of this is that you should care equally about everyone in the world right that's that's what this all kind of stands on and it's a very nice idea um uh, but i think the i think like ha ha having ha you know ha having this foundation of like you, sh you should actually care about everyone in the world equally you shouldn't care about you know help helping your family more than helping uh, you know, someone who's more deserving, all this kind of stuff. I, I think there is something, there is something lost in um, not having a sense of uh, a local community. You know, um, I, I think like a lot of people, you know, derive meaning from uh, close knit local communities. And even though it is a nice idea to like care about everyone equally, um, I think, yeah, it, it feels it feels to me like something is lost if you don't have a sense of the local community and you're sort of, you know, only ever focusing on uh, doing the most kind of good globally. Like, I, th I think I think a lot of people would have trouble with this. Um, and I, I, from, from what I write, I, I don't know if EA has a good, like, way of marrying these two things because the thing I'm talking about of local communities, it's completely unquantifiable. It's like stuff to do with, with like, meaning and, and things like that. You know, just, just like... Uh, oh, I you hate know. when you can't quantify important things. <laughs> yeah, so it, it's, it makes it really tricky. I mean, the way I kind of, you know, justify it in my head is like, okay, I have this, like, I have this need for local community and sort of uh, narrow meaning. And so I will, you know, I will be unethical and give money to the homeless man in London rather than give that money to someone more deserving. Or like, I'll be unethical and like, you know, do this do this thing which only like, helps people in, you know, in the place where I live, which is obviously, you know, much more well off than a bunch of other places around the world. I, I see that as like, okay, I'm not perfect. I'm going to do this thing, which is like definitely not doing the most good, but I'm, I'm sort of optimizing for like my own personal meaning, uh, you know, occasionally. Mm -hmm. How do you, do you think about that at all? Like what's the current sort of, how do EAs kind of think about this? Yeah. So that's a really tough question. Um, so I think the way I think about it, um, you, so I think it is just like, obviously true that if I can save a hundred lives that are far away, we'll never meet the people or one life of like somebody in the UK, I should save a hundred lives far away. Like yeah, that, that's a, that's a right answer and a wrong answer to that question. Um, yeah. but I don't think that's really engaging with the meat of what you're saying, which is that this feeling of local community and meaning is like important and something is lost if you just forget about it is that the key point yeah 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 it, it feels like something it, it feels like some 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 fundamental aspect of the human condition is lost if you completely ignore <laughs> that that you know yeah so the way i think about this i like to think about my life in terms of having budgets like um for example um I do not donate all of my money above exactly what I need to live to the world's poorest people. Wow. I know, I suck. I suck. <laughs> um, and right now. <laughs> most people in effective altruism do not do this. And in part, I think that's a good argument for not doing this. Because if you're on a movement where you say, you'll only let you in if you're wearing a hair shirt and nothing else, then <laughs> you're not really going to get many people on board. And right. the point is to be something that people actually want to be part of. Yeah. But I think the second point is that the feeling of meaning and my life not sucking is kind of important to doing good in the long term. Like, I really like the quote 
doing good is a marathon, not a sprint. Oh, okay. Like, yeah, yeah. if you're the kind of person who thinks about how can I aggressively optimize every last thing, and you're like, ah, personal meaning, how many dead kids in Africa is that worth? Like, one. Right. Get rid of that. <laughs> um, <laughs> then you're probably going to stop trying to do good after, like, a few months and just burn out. And this means that over the course of your life, you don't do that much good. Um, but also, if you only ever help people in your local community, um, you're not doing that much good for the world. And yeah. so I, I like to think of my life in terms of having budgets. Like, I will think about the amount of time and energy that I want to spend on things to do with altruism. And I'll say maybe 80% of that is going to, like, the things that I think are most effective. And 20% of that I just want to spend in the ways that, like, feel meaningful to me. Yeah. And you make that split once, and you never think about it again. Okay. Because you, you really don't want the thing where every time you're thinking of where you can sp spend a pound, you're like, man, I could give £20 to that homeless guy, but then I could instead give it to a kid dying of malaria. Yeah. And you really don't want that decision every day. That's like, that takes stressful, yeah. so much energy. <laughs> um, so one thing I really like, there's this thing called the Give What We Can Pledge that um, I know Ali has signed and did an awesome video about. And the idea is you pledge some amount of your income, say 10%, to give to effective charities. And then you just say, okay, that part of 10% of my income is just gone. I'm going to figure out where to spend that effectively. And effectiveness is the only thing I care about here. And then what a lot of people do is they say, okay, 10% is the bar. I am giving that. But with the other 90%, I can do whatever I want. And if I want to fund a new playground for a local park near me, I can do that. Um, but don't take it from the budget that's trying to make yeah, the world yeah. better and effectively as you can. Yep. And that's the best way I found of balancing between these two. And that's okay. kind of key because I'm a mathematician. I want things to be principles. I want there to be a perfect solution. Right. But it takes a lot of energy to think about these questions and just... Yeah. Drawing the line in the sand, saying that's my budget, is the best solution I've come up with. Yeah, I think I think the I think the budget thing it's it's a good like practical solution. I do think it's a massive cop out though because it doesn't address the like the the actual like philosophical problem of you know should we be like completely utilitarian and sort of ignore this you know important part of being a human. Like it, I I don't I don't think it actually addresses the thing, but I, I think it, it's like a good pragmatic way to live day to day, and, and it's yeah. similar to how I do it as well, actually. Yeah, I think. The my utilitarian case is this whole thing about having this feeling of meaning is like important to my long term motivation and happiness. Um, yeah. If I want to improve the world as effectively as I can, I need to be long term happy and motivated. Okay, and yeah, the yeah, budget yeah. is just a way of implementing that. I get that. No, I, I'm going to continue to push it back. I, I, I think that is still a cop out because. <laughs> all right, give me. Yeah. I, I think it's a cop out because um, you're. St yeah, because. You, you're essentially still denying that there can be another, like, an another sort of um, justifiable motivation. You know, you're, you're saying that you're basically saying, right, the only justifiable motivation is to do do the most good, and I'm just trying to like hack my life so that I can live long long enough and happy enough to keep doing the most good. But you're 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 still denying the fundamental like human thing of. What what I think is a fundamental human thing of like uh, local community um, and some like you know local tribe. I, I think you're, I think you're denying that and you're saying that actually um, the, it's actually the, only the utilitarian kind of saving lives that that counts. Hmm. And, and I'm and I'm doing this budgeting thing in service of that. And I, and I I think like I think a lot of people I think EA doesn't sit right with a lot of people because it, I haven't seen anything that really addresses this. And I feel like. It would be great if there was a way of saying, like, yes, the sort of utilitarian approach of saving lives is, you know, is is good and 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 you should do that. But also, like, there is some kind of I don't know, maybe you call it duty or something to like to to local community. Uh, and it would be nice if the framework can kind of uh, holistically allow both of those two things to exist. Whereas I think the the thing I've heard from EAs is, is like. The, you know, you sort of have to subscribe to the fully utilitarian thing of saving lives, and like, you know, that that's sort of the only source of uh, 
uh, the only kind of justifiable kind of value or way to live or, or, or whatever. Do, do you get what I mean? Um, and I think that's a little, I, I found that a little dissatisfying. I think that's like, um, it's, yeah, it's sort of something that other people struggle with as well. But I, I don't think there's a good answer, by the way. I'm not, I'm not, I'm not trying to push you to, to like <laughs> give like some grand um, theory about this. <laughs> um, yeah. Yeah. I think one of the things that's kind of messy here is, so like my mind runs on this biological hardware that has evolved in over hundreds of thousands of years, living in tribes of less than 100 people. And this means that I'm hardwired to think about the mm. people in my local community. Yeah. And this is just like a thing that's hard coded into my mind. But the world we live in is so different. There are 7 billion people who live in condition, many of whom live in conditions far worse than the things I see around me. Yeah. And my mind just like can't cope with this. <laughs> and that leads to weird tensions like the ones you're talking about. Yeah, yeah. Um, another thing that might be slightly satisfying is the idea that what matters isn't whether I personally feel the feeling of local community, but that it exists. And that if I can like make the lives of many people better, such that they can support the local community, okay, then yeah, like yeah. maybe that's more important than me personally feeling it. Guys, I think I've got a solution. All right. The solution oh. is that this whole, I feel like this whole debate is basically the marshmallow test on steroids. <laughs> <laughs> Our human brains are hardwired to want the marshmallow right now because of various things. But if we can delay our human urge for the marshmallow right now and delay the gratification, we will get more, more marshmallows in the future. Similarly, our human, our imperfect human brains are hardwired to seek meaning in the local community right now. And therefore, knowing that we have to at least counteract that feeling slightly by thinking about the fact that okay i need to <laughs> i need to sort of not weight that so highly because my intellect is not capable of uh, sort of counteracting this sort of tens of thousands of years of evolution it's just the marshmallow test on steroids <laughs> i don't think that I, I think i think that's like i think that's pretty similar to what neil was saying and i think yeah i, th I, th I think it's the same cop-out that's that's saying like the the only you know justifiable valuable thing to do is is all the life saving and, and and look this is like a it's almost almost like an axiomatic thing but i think it, again you, you're also, you're basically saying uh no it's not really justifiable to care about the local community thing we need to fight this because the only thing that's justifiable is saving lots of lives i think a lot of people would feel that it is almost a starting point that you know some aspect of local community or like caring for example caring about your family is like the most constrained form of local community right um it's like a starting point thing i'm not making like some uh you know propositional claim um that like oh you know you should care about family i think a lot of people have a starting point of you know they care about their local community they, they they will just see that as a starting point of like what counts in life and what you and what you're saying is that you know that doesn't count in life what counts in life is saving all the lives and so i, I don't think that really solves the problem i think i think that's yeah it'll be my point is just that it would be nice if there was a principled way to allow for both of these things but I think currently, in, in terms of philosophically where EA is, there's actually no way to do that. And um, I think a lot of people have trouble with EA for that reason. I mean, so I guess it's uh, similar to, like, the thing that comes to mind is, is, is uh, this thing I've been, I've been debating with people for months about uh, this idea of self-improvement versus self-acceptance and how there is, there is, in fact, no <laughs> sort of firmly westernly philosophically i.e sort of logically rational way of squaring these two that you know this this balance between self-acceptance and self-improvement and in fact if we take a more quote eastern philosophy approach to it where there is this yin and yang there is this balance and we actually don't have to fully reconcile these things we can care about self-improvement while at the same time also caring also accepting ourselves we can think about improving the world as a whole effectively while at the same time also being invested in our, in our local community i agree it would be nice if there were if there were a firm sort of equation to satisfy this but I yeah think, obviously I, yeah, yeah. You, you you can definitely care about both things but i think like i yeah i don't think we're going to make too much progress in this, but i think like yeah. in caring about both things it is somewhat you know there's a bit of a sort of cognitive dissonance because like i think the ea kind of philosophy really does require you to buy into the very utilitarian way of looking at things where that's one thing you value but obviously like practically yeah you can definitely live your life um, caring about both things and being okay that it's slightly inconsistent or being okay that it's whatever, right? And I, I imagine yeah. everyone, everyone who is in here lives like that. 
<laughs> yeah. Yeah, I think there's like one thing people take from this part of the conversation. It's that you can be an EA and you can also care about local community, yeah, your yeah. family, and having kids. <laughs> and like a lot of people do. Yeah. But <laughs> and if you feel this like tension, you don't have to just give up on the idea of improving the lives of everyone. Yeah. Though yeah, I that's, agree that's, that's that it's funny. not principled, <laughs> and this also yeah. annoys me as well. <laughs> but anyway, should I return to saying what the hell the EAs actually believe? Please, yes. <laughs> so, um, yeah. So the, the key insight that I'm going to hammer on again and again is this idea of spread. That there is a big difference in how much good different things can do. And one of the really important this ways this manifests is I kind of think of effective altruism as being about 80-20 and doing good. Like, there's 80% of the effort gets 20% of the good done, 20% gets 80% of the good done. You just should always be looking for, like, the big wins and doing those and just forgetting about the rest. And one of the biggest ways this manifests is this idea called um, cause neutrality. So I think a lot of, like, altruistic movements are focused around a cause, like gender equality, climate change, uh, protesting against the war, things like that. And, but I think that the problem you're working on is one of the biggest determiners of how much good you do, because there's a really big spread between how important different problems are. And so what effective altruists do, they say, I just want to do the most good. I don't know which causes matter the most. So I'm going to be neutral between them. Um, and try to figure out which ones matter most. Um, this is again another point where this tension with like personal connection comes up, where people who say lost a grandparent to breast cancer really care about breast cancer charities or something like that. The way I kind of think about this is I have a personal connection to people living and flourishing in general. It doesn't matter what stop the thing, the specific thing that stops them living and flourishing. I just want the world to be better. And it doesn't matter whether somebody loses a parent to breast cancer or like war or whatever. I just want to make sure as many people as possible don't lose somebody. Um, and figuring out the right cause is kind of hard. But a heuristic I find useful is look for the groups who don't have power and don't have a voice. The people who are disenfranchised by society. Because... You can kind of think about the world as there is an optimal way that we would try to help everyone, but the people who can argue for themselves get a lot more power and resources. So the people who can't argue for themselves are going to not have as much as they should have. And three big groups are the world's poorest people. Um, this leads to problems like work in global health and development, um, non-human animals, which leads to areas like work on factory farming, and clean meat, and um, future people, like people who don't exist yet, who have no political representation, but where we're doing things now that could really affect them, like climate change, um, not thinking about catastrophic risks in our society, like risks of future pandemics. Um, personally, I think that future people is the one on this list that people find most surprising. But also the one that I think in some sense matters most. Like, it's hard to estimate just how many future people will be, there will be, but it feels pretty safe to say there'll be a lot more than are alive today. But then if we look at any problem that affects the future, like climate change, it's blindingly obvious that the world today neglects their interests. And um, this combines with another bias society has, where we don't pay a lot of attention to like small risks of really big things, like, say, pandemics. Um, and I think there are a bunch of, like, small risks that could cause massive catastrophes that will affect people of generations to come, or even cause human extinction. And these will massively affect future people, but society doesn't think about them. Um, this leads to a kind of more general insight that I find helpful for thinking about altruism which is what I call looking for big deals. So if you look at history, I'd say that for the most part, history is dominated by like a 
few events or trends that really mattered, like World War One and World War Two, or new technologies like the Industrial Revolution, computers or technology uh, or electricity, or like medical technology like vaccines and sanitation. Yeah. And when you only have so much time and attention, you want to focus on the things that have loads of leverage. And when we're thinking about big deals that could happen in the future, um, I think that one thing that could really matter is these catastrophic risks, like climate change, nuclear war, and natural pandemics are like obvious ones. Um, more speculatively, I think that future big technologies could massively affect how civilization goes, like AI or synthetic biology. Blockchain. And I think this year has made it pretty clear that society does not, or rather, 2020 has made it pretty clear that society does not think about these risks. And one thing that EAs care about a lot, that I'm feeling a lot more invested in now, is preventing future pandemics. Um, and people have been talking about this for years and how the world is unprepared. Um, and one thing that I find kind of exciting is that there are actual things we could do about this. Like, there's a company called Sherlock Biosciences who are working on making broad-spectrum testing, which means you can have tests where you could put a sample from a patient on them, and it could, like, show you all of the different pathogens, viruses, and bacteria in there, and let you know if there's something novel in there. And, like, just imagine a world where in Wuhan, back in December 2019, they had these tests. Some people came in with some weird pneumonia, they put all these tests, they're like, oh, huh, there's something new here. That's kind of concerning. Maybe we should lock down this neighborhood of Wuhan. This weird novel pneumonia goes through this neighborhood of Wuhan, it doesn't spread, and nobody in the West ever pays attention to that new story. That's the kind of world I want to live in. And I think it's a world yeah. we could live in. But it's not the kind of thing society invests that many resources in. It is an altruist. I care about that a lot. Does that make sense so far? Yeah, I'm on board with that. Um, cool. The two other tools that I, I and EAs find helpful. Um, the second tool is that finding the best ways to do good is really hard. The world is complex and difficult to understand, so you're going to be wrong about things. And this means that you need to be putting in constant effort to have true beliefs. Um, like, that's why we call it cause neutrality, not why you should only care about future people and that's the right cause that matters. Because we're, like, um, we could be wrong. You need to think about tools like what are your biases, using cost-effectiveness calculations rather than intuitions, testing your beliefs. One key thing for me is when somebody disagrees with me, actually trying to hear them out and take them seriously and understand why we disagree. Because sometimes when I do this, I'm like, oh, huh, I was just wrong. Thanks for letting me know. <laughs> nice. Um, and it's easy to just get defensive and be like, no, you're wrong. I'm awesome. Everything I'm saying is true. Um, and a third, a more speculative, speculative tool that people in the community have been talking about a lot in the last few years is this idea that you should be willing to be ambitious and pursue uncertain strategies that could be really important. Um, the idea here is that if we look at ways people have tried to do good in the past, most of the impact came from a few things that were really big deals, and that like the average impact per person was dominated by a few people who just did things that went amazingly well. And so you want to try to be that kind of person. Um, this is the same kind of insight as a venture capitalist who funds a thousand startups, thinking one might be big, the rest will fail. Um, an example I really like here. Do you guys know the story of Stanislav Petrov? No. Um, so he was a, um, I think, lieutenant in the Russian military during the Cold War, back in the 80s. And he was monitoring their nuclear weapon warning systems. And... The systems told him there are five missiles incoming, and it was his job to, like, raise the alarm, say, um, the US is launching missiles in us, we, should, we need to launch back, and basically starting a nuclear war. And he said, wait, 
why have they sent us five missiles only rather than thousands? This makes no <laughs> yeah. sense. And he just didn't do anything about this. And um, this late, this turned out to be sunlight glinting off clouds and a bug in the system. <laughs> and if he had raised the alarm, there's a realistic chance this could have led to World War Three, and like killed hundreds of millions of people directly and possibly billions for the ashes from the city uh, ashes from burnt cities just like blocked out the sun and caused what's called a nuclear winter that could like destroy global agriculture and um the thanks he got was that he was kind of demoted informally punished because it was really embarrassing and it was just massively hushed up until after the cold war and I think that he saved billions of lives. And it's just Wait, this one nuts. guy that's who so was in the right, at the right time. And another thing that's kind of terrifying about the story is, um, so the nuclear weapons were on what's called launch on warning, meaning when we think something bad is happening, we're willing to launch back to retaliate. And the US and Russia's missiles are still on launch on warning. <laughs> well, China's are not. China says... If you actually land nuclear weapons on our soil, we will launch things back at you. We have enough missiles that this will still fuck you up. But yeah. this isn't... But, like, we're not going to risk causing World War Three with bug <laughs> systems. Yeah. And, like, one person can do this much good. It's crazy. That's a great story. I never heard that before. <laughs> um, yeah. So, what are... What are some practical ways in which one can go about trying to become the next Petrov when <laughs> <laughs> uh, the fair. Russian military <laughs> um, yeah I mean becoming the next Petrov is hard um, I mean I'm pretty excited about more altruistic people going into something like the military and being in important positions like that but I'm not sure this is like the best thing people can be doing um, so one I think the main thing but I think about is again, how can you eighty twenty doing good when it comes to putting this into practice? Um, and again, this means identifying the big things that really matter. Um, and um, a slogan I quite like is "Get the big things right and don't sweat the small stuff." Hmm. A lot of the impact comes with the big things, but it's easy to burn a lot of energy stressing about the small stuff. Like, am I recycling right? Um, am I like? Am I saving money on this latte? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Uh, like, am I getting the cheapest groceries so I can save up more money to donate? And like, you'll burn loads of energy, and it just doesn't really matter. Um, so, a pretty common misconception is that yay is only about making donations, and it's only about evaluating charities and finding the best ones. Um, the way I like to think about it is, my life is kind of a collection of resources of which money is one of the resources and with the actions I take I choose how I allocate my resources to change the world like um, money is one but time energy my social capital my productive labor are others and um, for a lot of people the most important resource by far is their career like the length of the average career is 80,000 hours which is just an obscenely long time. Like, I have not lived, I don't think I've lived 80,000 hours. It's just like, yeah. uh, actually, that's not true. I think I have lived 80,000 hours, I'm like 22. I think I've lived 16,000. Some quick yeah. maths coming out. <laughs> um, it's a ridiculously long time, which is the important part. And um, you can kind of think of donations as just like converting your career into money. And then figure out what to allocate that money, which, like, can be a good way to use your career, but isn't obviously the best way. Um, and um, another thing that's kind of fucky when you realize you have 80,000 hours in your career is that if we think there's, like, more than 100 times spread in how much, how important different things can be, it makes a lot of sense to spend a lot of time prioritizing, thinking, and planning. And if you spend, like, 10% of your 80,000 hours planning, that's 8,000 hours, which is, like, I don't know, about 200 work weeks, or about four years of your life just thinking and planning. And, like, 
I don't intend to spend four, four years of my life thinking and planning about my career, but that would actually be a pretty reasonable thing to do. Your life is really long. Um, and so, like, obviously, thinking about your career is kind of intense. Um, I think there are some people who will hear this stuff and be like, oh my god, effective altruism, the movement I didn't know I needed. I want this to be a big focal point in my career. Some people who won't. And I think there are, like, lots of smaller things you can do, like just thinking about where you donate money and giving to good charities. Um, Gibble.org is a great resource for this, just saying. Um, but I think that figuring out whether you can do a lot of good with your career is, like, the first thing to think about. And one mistake that I made for a while is I kind of thought of my career as... I can do the things that will make me happy, or I can do things that are good for the world, and it's just this one-dimensional spectrum where these things trade off against each other. And, like, I'm not the kind of person who can drive themselves day in and day out with feeling that I'm doing the most good. Um, like, I'm just not that good a person, though I have some friends who are, and they are awesome people, and I respect them a lot. Um, and one of the things that clicked is that, one, motivation and my personal fit is really important with how I use, um, is like really important with choosing the right career. Like, you can't do high impact work doing a thing that you hate, but you think it's good for the world, so you force yourself into doing it. Um, I think this is a mistake I see in a lot of people. They, whether they care about doing good or not, they just think about their career in terms of what do my parents think I should do? What do the people around me do? Like, first year mathematicians at university who are convinced they want to be math academics, or uh, 16 year olds who are convinced they want to be a doctor, or a banker, or whatever. And um, I think this is crazy. Like, the right thing for me is not the right thing for the person next to me. Um, like, say, Ali, um, you're clearly really good at this whole um, YouTuber being an internet personality thing. Loads of people listen to you. This means that the best way for you to improve the world is probably not the best way for the average person to improve the world because you have this platform and leverage and loads of people who will listen to you and who you can like spread important ideas to. While for somebody, for like me, I do not think this is my calling and I should instead go and like solve some hard math problems in ways that are important for the world. Um, and I think another thing that kind of clicked is that there are, you can kind of shape the way you do things to be more or less motivating. Like, I've already talked about how I'm really socially influenced and having a community around me is really helpful. Um, I think this mindset of motivation hacking, um, is just like a really good thing to practice in general. Like... Back when I was in uni, um, I was a pretty neurotic person, and so it was exam term. And I knew that I was going to spend a bunch of time trying to uh, prepare for exams, but I thought this would be kind of boring. So I decided to set myself the goal of figure out how to do this in a way that was actually fun. And then I pursued these strategies, like um, starting a public revision lecture series, or writing up notes that I thought were actually good and like focus on intuitions and publishing those to people or like giving informal tutoring to my friends and I still achieved this core goal of like learning my course well and doing well on exams but that term was a blast and possibly the most fun time I had in all of you in like my entire time at university and I was just spending it like learning maths as well as I could um <laughs> And, I mean, these are just the things that I personally find motivating, because I like social things, I like teaching, I like people. Um, there are going to be different things for each person. Um, I wrote a blog post called Live a Life You're Excited About, that we can hopefully link in the show notes, that's trying to give some thoughts on how different people can find the things that make them motivated and excited. But... I think the key insight I want to convey is that you can look at the things you're doing, figure out the things that you find exciting and motivating, 
and shape the task tasked by those. Like, I get really motivated by the feeling of making progress and like ticking boxes off a, in, of a checklist. So every day I just make a checklist of the work I want to do that day and that makes it more fun. And I think there are, that doing these things can make like a massive difference. I can make a difference to the point that if I find a career that I think is really important for the world that I could be good at, then I can make it into something that I would actually have a good time doing. And I think that anyone listening to this who thinks this might work for them should really spend a lot of time trying and experimenting. Because if you can get motivation hacking right, it's like insane. Um, and uh, a slogan I kind of like for thinking about this whole thing in the context of altruism is um, you don't need to be a saint to do good. You don't need to be the kind of person who feels this like deep wellspring of passionate altruism and warm fuzzy feelings for the world. Um, like it's really awesome if you feel this. Um, a bunch of people in the movement do feel this and this is great. But if you don't feel this, but you can figure out how to like shape your life so that you do things that are important and have a good time even if the motivation just comes from like i really like my co-workers or these problems are fascinating what matters is the world is a better place as a result of your actions um there's a quote i really like to kind of tie off this section um courage isn't about not being afraid it's about being afraid and going ahead anyway similarly Caring isn't about being overwhelmed by emotion. It's about not feeling a strong emotional drive and doing the right thing anyway. Mm. That's great. Love it. That's very <laughs> good. <laughs> um, which is from, good. yeah, an article I found really motivating called On Caring. Oh, yes. I think Ali mentioned that in a previous newsletter. Indeed. Great article. Um, yeah, I used to think you had to feel for example, the way Lucia does, i.e. sort of genuinely feel the suffering of people to, you know, feasibly do good to the world and give to charity. And we're like, oh, I'm just not that kind of person. Then I read the article, it was like, damn, okay. <laughs> I don't need to be that kind of person. I can just do it anyway because it's the right thing to do. Yeah. One thing I find kind of helpful is rather than thinking motivation as this like big lump, separating it into drive and values. So a value is like, if I look back at my life 10 years from now, what things will I actually care about having achieved and doing? And drive is like, what keeps me motivated day to day? Like, what do I get up in the morning to do? And um, for me, altruism and doing good is like a really, really core value. And it's like kind of a drive. Like, I feel happy when I do good, but I have lots of other drives, like social motivation, status, solving fun problems, the feeling of excitement and novelty. And what matters is that I achieve my values. My drives don't have to be the fact that I'm achieving my values. Um, like, I think a lot of people listening to this probably care a lot about productivity and getting shit done. And um, one way that you can like hack your drives to do this is by listening to podcasts like this or following Ali on YouTube. Um, Thank you. <laughs> YouTube.com slash Ali Abdal. Is that the URL? It is. Very good. <laughs> um, and just like listening to people you respect talking about this, putting yourself in the social environment and people who care about that. And like that can achieve the value of doing loads of work without the really hard problem of having the drive of do loads of work. This is really, really good stuff. I definitely need to chat to you about this um, offline as well because a lot of this stuff is um making up some of the chapters of my upcoming book well i say upcoming it's 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 a long while a long while away about meaningful productivity and one of the main spiels in the book is going to be this idea of we've actually got a whole section about hacking motivation about how can we you know how can we align our wants with the things that we have decided in advance that are going to be goals that are worthwhile pursuing or things that are meaningful to us um on that note, uh, one thing that I've been thinking a lot about is values. And you seem to be quite clear on what your own values are. <laughs> At least that's how it comes across. <laughs> uh, do you have any ways that you find helpful of thinking about or identifying this list of values? Mm. So one 
So coming up with the values is like really hot. Um, but one idea that I've been kind of toying with over the last few months is um, when you have a hard problem, just be willing to spend a few hours working on it. Hmm. Like I, um, I get productivity coaching and a few months ago I was talking to my coach about how my biggest problem is I just don't have goals and I don't know what I'm aiming at mm. um, beyond this kind of like high level thing of making the world better. But like, what does that actually mean? And I realized from talking to her, I'd never actually just tried solving this. And so I just like blocked out two hours of my calendar, uh, opened an uh, empty document and just started trying to map out what my values and goals were. And I haven't solved the problem, but I feel like I made some decent progress. And getting into this mindset where you're not trying to find your perfect, fully formed goals, but you're just trying to, like, make progress on it and be a bit less confused. And, like, I go back to the document from time to time and, like, edit it, be like, I don't really agree with that anymore. But just, like, actually trying to make explicit the fuzzy board in my head is really helpful. And I, I find quite often when I'm chatting about things with friends they mention some big problem, like, I don't know what I'm doing with my life. And I say, have you ever just sat down for two hours and tried thinking about this? And they're like, no. And then sometimes <laughs> I can bully them into doing it. And <laughs> they say, like, oh, that was really useful. Yeah, um, I think be being, co being comfortable with just sitting down and thinking as an activity in itself, it's it's a bit weird. We're, I think we're, we're generally not used to that. Like, thinking is, this, is, is stuff that happens on the side while you're doing other <laughs> things. But, like, thinking as an activity in itself is, uh, <laughs> yeah. It, yeah, for some reason it's weird, but <laughs> another thing, another hack I'm a really big fan of is five minute timers. Like, mm. um, so the way I would start like a two hour block like this, which seems really intimidating, is to set a five minute timer and spend those five minutes listing things I could do to make progress on this and like get somewhere. And I find this is like I was really skeptical when I first heard the hack of just set a five minute timer and try solving this big problem because it seems like it can do anything to help. Um, but I, after doing it and seeing, holy shit, this really works. Um, I, I think it's that um, there's this mindset called learned helplessness, where something feels difficult and off-putting, and you just don't think about it. You don't want to think about it, and you flinch away. But if I set a five-minute timer, then I now have this sense of urgency um, I just need to get something done in five minutes. And I don't have time to be a perfectionist or think it's impossible. I just have to actually try for a few minutes. And a reflex I'm trying to build is anytime I'm ever complaining about a problem or feeling stuck, just set a five minute timer. And if I can't solve it in five minutes, I've lost nothing. But half the time I have a good idea. Uh, one thing i now i bought a physical timer and i keep it on my desk oh, nice. and oh, nice. it's great because when i have this feeling i can just reach over and twist the dial <laughs> and it's now five, now five minutes is going and it's just like completely effortless all right that's a great idea i'm gonna order a <laughs> yeah <laughs> I'm, I'm just thinking right i'm gonna, I'm gonna credit you, okay <laughs> five minute timer <laughs> uh yeah i, I quite like this design because like you twist the dial and then you have like a ring of plastic that gets slowly smaller Oh, uh, they're nice. called timer timers on Amazon, for some reason. Ooh, Amazon has a, a series of hourglasses. <laughs> that, Ooh, that, okay, that'd be hourglass fun. is even more stylish. A, f a five minute hourglass. Oh, right. Now I need to find, obviously, the perfect one that goes with a desk setup. Um, <laughs> because but... otherwise, you know, I can't be having, like, a bright red one. But, yeah. Um... Yeah, <laughs> hourglass. yeah, you can probably get, if you're wanting to shell out, you can probably get a custom timer made that's, like, exactly the decor of your desk. Oh my god! Future future YouTube videos, and mate. The, this is this is actually ingenious. And then it's also a tax deductible business. <laughs> <laughs> Am I right? I love it. <laughs> um, but yeah, another thing that I think is kind of helpful is just talking to people. Like, I'm a pretty extroverted person, and I find that a lot of my thinking is just done by talking to somebody, and just like bouncing ideas off a friend. Or like yeah. having a slightly awkward silence and the pressure of I need to find something to say this for this awkward silence is like a really good way to be creative. Yeah. <laughs> um but 
yeah I yeah that's it that, that's interesting so i've um i've been in in my quest to write this book i've been uh, trying to write two thousand words each day for the last well since since the start of the year and i did it it, it it worked well for the first six days and for the last three i haven't made much progress so i thought you know what this morning i'm gonna do the thing where you go for a walk and record a voice note where i sort of say my thoughts out loud and then use otter or descript to transcribe it and and, and stuff and I found that like, it's just not the same when you're just alone with your thoughts. And I was thinking it would be nice if I could ring someone up, record the conversation and then be like, right, let's talk about meaningful productivity. And we'll make, I'm sure we'll make some progress on this, like half an hour walk or something like that. Yeah, that I mean, on my hit me up. <laughs> I will, I will add you to my list of people. Next time you're doing this. <laughs> Sick. I mean, I'm kind of bad at being available, like when I get randomly called, but there's a chance. Oh, so I'll send you a calendar link. Uh, excellent. <laughs> If you, if you want to schedule in meaningful productivity chats, hit me up. Yeah. Oh, fantastic. Um, Speaking of, uh, this week was the first time I uh, used a Calendly link to schedule in a date. <laughs> oh, I love it. Yeah. Um, but I just thought I'd share that as like a win win for the week. I love it. Um, oh, yes. One, one of my uh, recent experiments for trying to optimize my lack of a dating life is I now have a go on a date with Neil anonymous form on my website. Oh, wow. Um, so far, all three responses have been jokes, but I'm optimistic. So, you know, okay, anyone we'll, listening we'll, to this, we'll definitely link up. to that page of the website. Um, Excellent. <laughs> Hopefully, we'll get some more inbound leads. Uh, um, what are your, what are your uh, qualif uh, qualifier questions on this form? Um, let's see. So, I tried to keep it reasonably. Sh I'm trying to balance between have it low enough effort people actually fill it out, but high enough effort it's not just complete trolls. So, the question. Other than like boring questions, it's <laughs> um, what oh, trolls are you... all right. <laughs> <laughs> um, what are you looking for in your romantic life right now? And I link to a blog post where I talk about like how I think about good friendships because that's also how I think about good relationships. Um, why did you decide to fill this out, or like what about me resonates, and like why are you interested in me, and um, what kind of things do you find exciting to think about or talk about? Hmm. Okay. And yeah, that's very yeah, I think, I think a big benefit of like having a sort of, uh, you know, having some kind of public self online where you're actually sort of broadly authentic about you know, in line with the way you actually are in real life. Is that like, you know, if, for example, if someone reads your blog and they really like, you know, the posts and the way you think and stuff, chances are you'll probably get on with them. And so it's actually a great filtering mechanism um, for, for this kind of stuff. Mm. Yeah, I think there's also this annoying thing with romance where if two people are interested in each other, there's a lot, there's a big barrier to saying anything. Because if the other person isn't interested, that's kind of awkward and might damage the friendship. Right. And this is just a good way to publicly signal, like... It's chill. It's chill, like, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> hit me up if things don't work out. I don't care. I still think you're cool. Yeah. Um, but yes. Anyway, uh, other than advertising for my love life, um, <laughs> maybe good to give a few more thoughts on like exactly what people should do if they want to use their career to make the world better. Oh, yeah, great. What's our call to action here? Um, yeah. Or, so I guess first I just want to talk about like careers generally, altruistic or no, because... I think careers are really important, and I see a lot of people making mistakes. And I think two of the biggest mistakes I see people making is one, just um, uh, especially like students and young people, is one, just like not thinking about it ever, and two, getting really stressed and overwhelmed about it. So I think it's crazy to never think about it, because your career is such a big fraction of life, it's like 80,000 hours, it's insane. Um, and more importantly, I think you can productively spend time when you're young to make the rest of your career better. And, um, but, and I think it's also kind of understandable to feel stressed and overwhelmed about it because there are people who are like, yes, I get that argument. It's a really big deal. Ah, uh, yeah. and, um, like I completely abide with this. Careers also stress me out. Um, but. I think this is a classic case of having unrealistically high standards for yourself. Like, people anchor themselves to thinking that they're, they're failing if they haven't perfectly solved this problem. And they don't perfectly know what they're doing with their life. 
And I kind of slip into this, like, um, I don't know what I'm doing with my life. I maybe feel like I should. You know, I'm 22, I've graduated, and then sometimes I chat with my friends who are 10 years older than me, and they say, what the hell are you talking about? I don't know what I'm doing with my life. This is completely fine. Nobody does. <laughs> um, but the solution also isn't to just give up on this. It's not a binary of confused or not confused. It's a spectrum. And the less confused you are, the more you can productively think about this. I find it helpful to think of it as an opportunity. Like, most things we ever do just don't matter in the long term. Like, um, when I look back on what I was doing a year ago, uh, other than going outside, which I should have done more of, um, yeah. most of it, just like, I don't really care. There are very few ways to trade time now to make the rest of my life better. And it's a pretty short, it's like, it's a very short list. There's like forming close and meaningful friendships, learning things and working myself and figuring out what the hell I'm doing with my life. And this is just an awesome opportunity to make things better. And I think that you can do things productively here. Um, there are like two key ways I like to think about this. Again, engaging with this core thing of confusion. Um, so first, becoming less confused. Um, I like to think about careers in terms of how can I gain as much information as I can? Like, is a puzzle? The world is big and overwhelming. Um, there are better and worse things I could be doing, and I want to figure out what these are. Um, so I need to be grounded and actually go out into the world, run tests, try things, and gain data. Um, I should just run loads of tests. Start with cheap things like talking to people, um, scale up, uh, asking for advice, scale up to more expensive things like doing projects, um, even more expensive things like doing internships, um, even doing jobs. I think you should think of your first job as just how can I gain as much information and data as I can? Um, and note that by career, I don't necessarily mean like getting a soulless corporate job or like a thing you necessarily apply for like i think that what ali is doing with being a popular figure or tame is doing with his startup these are both like careers in the sense of what you are doing with your life and your productive energy and for some people the startup founder lifestyle is a great fit for some people it isn't you can run tests to figure this out um i also think people should be a lot more willing to ask for help uh my Actually, my most recent blog post was just about how I personally suck at asking for help and how to do this more. Like, I've got so much value from asking mentors for advice and, like, what what is your job like? Um, what things do you think I'm currently missing? How should I test fit? What should I be thinking about? Um, like, I'm confused at the point that I'm currently on a gap year of just doing a series of internships to get more data and see what different things are like. Um, and the second thing is, you're already confused. Another thing you can do is to be robust to the confusion and do things that are just good, no matter what your like long-term goals are. And I think one of the best ways of doing this is what I call becoming awesome. Like trying to get skills, learn things and become better. I think it's especially good to focus on the meta skills, like productivity, social skills, communication, how to learn things better. Like, in my university experience, I probably put in more effort to self-improvement and getting better at learning than I actually did learning maths, and I think that paid off pretty well. Um, investing in things like this just pays off in the rest of your life, and I think that if you actually spend time being strategic about this, like, what skills are your bottleneck? How can you get practice and get better at those? And then actually doing it um, just pays off really good dividends. Um, 80,000 Hours, who were a effective altruist organization who specialize in career advice and have loads of other awesome ideas, call this career capital. And the idea is that one of the big variables explaining how you do over the over a like 40 year career is just how much skills do you gain, especially early on, and that you should focus on these over anything else like success or prestige. 
like how can you put yourself in a better position um cal newport's book so good they can't ignore you is also a pretty great thing on careers and hammers this point him a lot um so those are like careers in general how can people do things better um if you specifically care a lot about doing good with your career um and again career is like one of the biggest things you have for shaping the world um so if you care about altruism think about how you can do this well is awesome um so firstly there's a organization called 80,000 hours they're really really awesome and their career advice is way better than anything i can say in the next 10 minutes and they have an article called their key ideas series uh which we can hopefully link to in the show notes uh people should just like go read that and there are like years of evidence-backed research and one of the annoying things about trying to give career advice in a podcast is everyone's journey is different and everyone's like optimal career path is different so everything i have to say ends up being a bit generic um so yeah one i said this all already but i'll reiterate it motivation and good fit is really 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 important um there's a lot of spread between different careers it doesn't matter how much good they do but also between different people in the same path like the best researcher does maybe like 10 to 100 times as much research as the average one and you're not going to be exceptional unless you really care about what you're doing and you're actually motivated about it so that's really important to pay attention to and you're also, like doing good as a marathon not a sprint you don't want to burn out um i think it's easy when you start thinking about doing good to just only think about sacrifice and i think that's really wrong-headed um I also think it's easy to have a limited view of altruistic careers like when you ask most people what kind of careers do good they're probably going to say things like um being a doctor volunteering with a charity going and working for an ngo in a developing country and i think this is all cool but there are a load of other things um a brain dump of some problems that i think really matter um biosecurity that's thinking about future pandemics and how to prevent them or prepare for them where you can do things like work on like work with biology and biotechnology try to influence policy to make it better um understanding emerging technologies especially ai which i think is like probably one of the biggest deals that's going to happen in the next century um i think there are a lot of important technical problems here that can be solved to get systems that do exactly what we want rather than just things that kind of do what we want there's lots of important policy work like if half of all jobs are going to be automated in the next 50 years how can we make sure that this is good for the world rather than just creating an even more hyper rich class and just how can the world adapt to these big social trends um doing research into how to prioritize between problems um and like are there important problems we're missing this can do with like talented economists um philosophy researchers social scientists um working on global health like just earning a lot of money and donating it can make a really big difference here um working in policy working for ngos um working on global development like if you're an economist working with governments in poorer countries um making lives better for factory farmed animals like going and campaigning and talking to companies working on technologies like clean meat um working on problems like climate change i think one of the big bottlenecks here is policy uh another thing i want to see lots of work on is a lot of the risks from climate change are dominated by the really bad scenarios where we have like a lot more warming than we expect like rather than having two or three degrees we have like six degrees but very few people will research that stuff and extreme climate change um a lot of these problems are kind of underlaid by having a messy political system where politicians want to look good for the next five years rather than thinking long term people don't use best practices from forecasting and like actually making the world better and getting political systems that do that would be awesome and i don't know what needs to be done to make that happen but i think there's good work that's been done there 
another thing is, um, you don't necessarily have to, like, directly, like, be a researcher on these problems. Like, earning a lot of money and donating it to organizations doing good work is awesome. Um, be doing kind of outreach and getting other people caring about them is awesome. Um, being a kind of, like, more meta person, like, being a manager or doing operations work at an organization doing a lot of good. Um, generally just spreading important ideas in the world, like being a journalist or, say, uh, being a YouTuber who talks about important things in his videos, hint, hint. Um, uh, yeah, uh, end ramble about <laughs> ways nice. you go. But okay. there's one thing in there that listeners can connect with. Yeah, um, fantastic. If you're kind of feeling overwhelmed by all of the options, a good way of getting traction is like, sit down and try to figure out which problems you think are most important. Um, I think 80,000 Hours has a bunch of good write-ups on different things. There are also a lot of problems they haven't had time to think about, or which are like hard to think about, but might as well be a really big deal, like systemic change. Finding the ones that you care about the most, which is a pretty personal question. And then thinking about the different ways you could work on each of these problems and seeing which of them might fit you well, and then think about what you could do to get information about this and like explore and test it. Um, that was a long ramble. So to recap the key points from that, um, careers are really, really important. This massively affects, this is like a big chunk of your total impact on the world. This will affect both your happiness and fulfillment and also just how the world is different. So this is one of the best things to think about. Um, I think it's useful to see it as an opportunity, not a duty or an obligation. Um, you can orient towards getting information to become less confused. You can focus on gaining skills and career capital, even if you are confused, and that's just a robustly good thing. And um, if you care about altruism, I would recommend figuring out the most important problems and then thinking about which careers you think could help with those that are high impact and might fit you well. And you should go read what 80,000 Hours has to say about this, because it's far better than anything I'm saying right now. Amazing. That oh, seems yeah, like... we'll, we'll definitely link to 80k in the show notes. Yeah, I've been, I was taking notes throughout of all the other things that were mentioned, so we will link to as many of the things that I can decipher my handwriting on <laughs> as well along with Neil's blog and 80,000 hours and all the other resources that we talked about in the podcast. So mm -hmm. I feel like that's a good place to wrap things up. Um, Let's give a closing thought then. Yes, of course. Um, yeah. I think if there's like one key message you take from this, it's the, if you are like my past self and you think doing good is important, but you're kind of doing nothing about it, um, you can actually use something about this and you don't have to be an amazingly good person to make making the world better big thing in your life and you can do this while having an awesome life and um if you vibe with this and you vibe with how i think about things um come chat with some effective altruists we're cool people um if there's a like there's lots of local effective altruist groups across the world especially in big cities and universities um i can link to a map of like different groups across the world and there's a bunch of online events nowadays so if you want to come hang out with people and see if it's the kind of people you want to spend more time with, I think that'd be great. Checking out 80,000 hours and their thoughts on careers. And finally, um, I think EA is a kind of messy, complicated topic and lots of people disagree about it. And I really hate it when I'm listening to somebody talking about something I know a lot about. And I'm like, they got all of these things wrong and this is terrible. And this happens all of the time if you're talking about effective altruism. And I really don't want to be that guy. Um, so there was this great article recently about misconceptions about effective altruism when people hear popular betrayals. So I was thinking we might link to that in the show notes and people can check that out. And then if they left this podcast thinking something and the article says it's a misconception, it's completely my screw up. I see. I think I, I think I read that article when it came out a few weeks ago. Um, yeah, I think like I've seen lots of discussions about EA on Twitter and it's it seems like there's like a, a cabal of EA haters where like 
yeah, I'll often see like a thread on Twitter where I feel like EA is being completely misrepresented and people are sort of like hating on a thing that it is, that doesn't actually exist. Um, so yeah, I think that article is really good. Yeah, I think like a lot of EA ideas went viral like about eight years ago when the movement was Right, right, like, yeah. Go to Wall Street and earn loads of money. Yeah. And give to like RCT backed charities with all of the issues that Global Aid has and never think about things like high level change. And yeah, all, yeah. never think about emotion and be a cold calculating person. <laughs> um, I try to not fall into any of those traps here. Yeah, for sure. But if uh, sweet, you know, yeah. EA, please email me with your hate and I'd love it. Yeah, we'll link to all that stuff. Where can people find you online, Neil? So your uh, website is neilnanda.io, is that right? Yep. Um, that's my blog. Um, I have about 100,000 words of random essays on there. Um, mostly to do with like rationality, productivity, motivation, and social skills. So I think preparing for this podcast has inspired me to like write some more things about EA because it's oh, nice. to actually work out my thoughts on things. <laughs> and I have a top post section on there with like my favorite posts and places to stop. So people want to hear me ramble even more. You should go check out my book. Um, that's uh, Neil Nanda, N E E L N A N D A dot I O, and we'll, uh, we'll drop a link to that as well. Yeah. Sweet. Um, you can also Sweet. my contact details, email me, um, or fill out either of my contact Neil or Google forms. Yeah, man. Thanks for, thanks for coming on the podcast, Neil. Uh, Usually we end with uh, reading a review. So, Tamar, do we have any? Yeah, uh, we actually had, a, we had be... a really scathing review. Acceptable uh, to read out loud. <laughs> I think this is acceptable to read out loud. Great. It's scathing towards me, so I can't imagine anyone else objecting to this. Uh, all right. So this uh, this is a one-star review uh, from Maya underscore 94 in Great Britain. Uh, it's entitled Disappointing Episode. Uh, Maya says, I've been a listener of the podcast since its infancy. The latest podcast episode, Misogyny, Generalization, and Controversial Topics, was hard for me to listen to. It was poorly conducted, and throughout the majority of the conversation, there was a defensive undertone by the hosts, especially Tamor. It felt like it felt more like a year nine English class debate rather than a discussion of the topics uh, misogyny and generalization in an open, non judgmental environment. I expected an intellectual and well researched episode, but what was presented to us was the inner, unedited ramblings of both hosts. Both Ali and Tamor constantly interrupted the guest, guest host Sheen, dismissed her opinion, and told her on multiple occasions that she was uncomfortable with the topics of discussion, even though she had stated that she was happy discussing the topics, which I found extremely ironic given that the podcast is titled Misogyny. Once Sheen stated why generalized statements cannot be made without context to Ali, instead of listening to why biases and generalizations are detrimental to society, Tamor interrupted Sheen to defend his brother repeatedly, stating that she was taking this conversation somewhere it didn't need to be taken. I could not finish this episode. I had to end it at one minute, uh, one hour 32, when another dismissive statement was made by Tamor. Although a lot was discussed, nothing was of substance. I kept shouting, just listen, listen to the hosts. Um, this could have been a really productive and useful episode, but it just continued to resemble a car wreck as the episode went on. Um, pretty scathing review. That might be the worst review we've ever had of any episode. Um, <laughs> if it helps, I not very listened to. Maybe I'm a guy who knows. <laughs> yeah, so I, th I think, uh, I think the, the episode, last week's episode was probably the episode that's gotten the most responses and probably the most polarized responses. Uh, I think on, on, on one side, we had a bunch of like emails and DMs I mean, a bunch of people actually said this thing about, like, I could not finish this episode. It was too frustrating. Uh, and a bunch of people said, I couldn't, I couldn't finish this episode. It was too frustrating because, like, um, you know, you, you guys just, uh, you know, you weren't kind of um, pushing back enough against, um, you know, some of the stuff Sheen was saying. Or, you know, a lot of people were, I guess, in favor of our point of view and where we were coming from. And they felt like we weren't actually, you know, properly trying to justify that. And then a few people were also in the camp um, of this reviewer where they um, were less sympathetic to our view and they felt like, uh, you know, we were too kind of entrenched in our own views. Um, yeah, it's, it's, it's very interesting just, just how, how polarized it was. Yeah, and it, even on like specific points. So for, for example, you know, the reviewer says, that, you know, I actually messaged Sheen after this, uh, after reading the review and asked her if she felt like I was interrupting her and dismissing her and things like that. And she said she actually didn't feel that way at all. Um, and it's, it's interesting that this, this reviewer brings up, uh, you know, I remember there was a couple of points where I think there was one point where I asked Sheen if she felt attacked by something 
And she, I think she said she felt like a little bit attacked or something. And this person, um, th this reviewer highlighted that as like a bad thing where I was like, uh, you know, trying to claim that she was uncomfortable uh, when she wasn't. And we actually had another one, uh, someone else who I think uh, in an email or a tweet, I can't remember exactly where it was, said that, oh, it was good that you guys were actually a bit empathetic and could tell that sort of, um, you know, at, at some points, you know, she may have been more uncomfortable talking about this than you guys were. And so like, even on, you know, on a, on a high level, uh, it's very polarizing in terms of like broadly how it was conducted. And then even mm -hmm. on very specific things, like different people have had completely opposite takeaways and interpretations of very specific things uh, in the episode. So clearly that sort of the uh, gender issues is something we need to discuss a little bit more on the podcast. Well, yeah, it seems like yeah, a for sure. topic to handle well. Yeah, no, I think it's a tricky topic to handle well. Um, yeah, I think, um, yeah, I, I, I think we didn't really get to the bottom of anything. I think like a lot of the episode was spent trying to get on the same page about things. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think we eventually kind of got on the same page about a few things. But yeah, I think definitely more more discussion to be had um about the topic indeed so watch the space and if you're not subscribed to the podcast already you should hit that subscribe button so you get new episodes downloaded to your phone uh, or podcast player wherever you get these episodes cool and then the final thing is that this week we actually kicked off the not overthinking members community uh, it started off as uh, a whatsapp group and then we very quickly switched to slack because it's very hard to have uh, multiple conversations on whatsapp and for lots of people to contribute uh, so now we now have the slack group uh there are currently 54 people in it uh we'll we'll be keeping it closed off uh, for the, just these people probably for the next few weeks as we figure out you know what should the group actually look like what benefits should members actually get and things like that um, and then hopefully in a few weeks time uh once uh the, the group and us have figured out how things should work then we can uh, start expanding it a little bit uh, so stay tuned for that absolutely thank you everyone for joining and we'll see you next week at a blast thanks for the episode cool thanks for coming neil that's it for this week. Thank you for listening. If you like this episode, please leave us a review on Apple Podcasts or on the Apple Podcasts website if you're not using an iPhone. There's a link in the show notes. If you've got any thoughts on this episode or any ideas for new podcast topics, we'd love to get an audio message from you with your conundrum, question, or just anything that we could discuss. Yeah, if you're up for having your voice played on the podcast and your question being the springboard for our discussion, email us an audio file mp3 or voice note to hi at notoverthinking.com. If you've got thoughts but you'd rather not have your voice played publicly, that's fine as well. Tweet or DM us at nOverthinking on Twitter, please.